welcome back to the cutscenes of MGS5. I'm your host, as always, Joran Lee. Consider liking, subscribing, and backing the channel on Patreon for more quality content like this. Let's begin. about an AI. That was Coldman's mistake ten years ago. Be that as it may, we'll need to modify postural control to accommodate a human pilot. I share your urgency, but we need more time to finish it. on leaving us, Doctor? Huh? What? Uh, what? Uh, uh, We're uh, taking uh, your uh, legs uh, back! Uh, uh, <laughs> This is mine now. While writing this, I picked back up MGS4 for the first time in a while, and I noticed something. Or rather, I noticed a resemblance to someone. See if you can figure out from this selection what I mean. Boss. Good. Nice transmission. He's been in contact with the boss. Right. The time has come for you to witness. Witness our moment of triumph! When the world witnesses Sahalanthus, the hands of the Doomsday Clock will roll on, regardless of zero. Our purpose in life is to fulfill our destinies. And once all is returned to zero, the world can be reborn. 
people will swallow their behavior. They will link lost hands. The world will become one. The system is mine! Your guns and your weapons are no longer your own. Behold! Guns of the Patriots! Behold! Today is the day weapons learn to walk upright! Do you see this, Cyril? We are victorious! Behold! Guns of the Patriots! In order to fool the system, use nanomachines and psychotherapy to transplant Liquid's personality onto his own. He used hypnotic suggestion to turn himself into Liquid's mental doppelganger. For all our advances in nanotechnology, information and genetic control, they've never managed to control people at will, let alone turn one person totally into another. Yes, that's right, Skullface bears a lot of similarity, I think, with Ocelot. But what might it mean if it's true that Skullface and Ocelot bear such striking similarity? I mean, is Kojima just repeating himself, or does this matter on some deeper level? Well, I believe I have an answer. One at least. In the meantime, though, we'll have to skip over Quiet's cutscene for now to jump right into Skullface's reappearance in Hellbound. During this mission, we're tasked by Miller to track down and rendition a certain Soviet scientist, Huey Emmerich. The irony is, of course, Huey's originally an American. The entire premise here obviously serves as a reference to the events of the Virtuous Mission in 1964. The only question is, as always here, one of ambiguity. It's left unsaid whether this dim echo of yesterday is merely an easter egg outside the world of the game for the player to find, or somehow related to the subjective point of view that we're inhabiting of a ghost who thinks he's this legendary cold warrior big boss. This deconstruction in the postmodern sense of the very concept of the fourth wall is of course a Kojima trademark. And we'll see it has more than you might think to do with how we started, the question of Ocelot's resemblance to Skullface and vice versa. But turning back to Huey, the whole question of Huey's guilt in tragedies both past present and future remains itself here ambiguous for reasons that will surely for us come eventually to light. But for now, in the story for the first time player, we only have Ocelot's accusations and Miller's vengeful theatrics to go off. XOF. Kisses and hugs followed by a big F U. All because of Miller's blind spot. A back door into Mother Base no one suspected. You remember a certain scientist? Huey was responsible for bringing the inspection team on board. Giving the enemy a perfect opportunity to hit you at home. Right before the attack, Huey was in the control tower to prepare for the inspectors. He was with them when it all went down. The control tower collapsed with the rest of its strut. His body was never recovered. But he was the one who met the inspection party when they arrived. And he was the one who showed the nuclear inspectors to the tower. You remember the way it went. First he recommends we agree to the inspection. Then he gives them the okay without our permission. All the time acting as if he was doing us a favor. On top of that, he even had the guards disarmed that day. It would send the wrong message, he said. Whatever the angle, it all leads back to Huey. Naturally, we might already assume Huey's guilt in the destruction of MSF nine years ago for these reasons. It's the conclusion we've been led to merely think we've come to on our own. That's key for the strangeness of what happens further. I submit the narrative in Hellbound, like the world after the end of World War II, I suppose, is actually split into two. In a word, we might call it doublethink. 
And of course, doublethink may also apply to the relationship between Ocelot and Skullface. There is a need for an unwearying moment-to-moment -moment flexibility in the treatment of facts. The key word here is black one. Like so many newspeak words, this word has two mutually contradictory meanings. Applied to an opponent, it means the habit of impudently claiming that black is white, in contradiction of the plain facts. Applied to a party member, it means a loyal willingness to say that black is white when party discipline demands this. But it means also the ability to believe that black is white, and more, to know that black is white, and to forget that one has ever believed the contrary. This demands a continuous alteration of the past, made possible by the system of thought which really embraces all the rest, and which is known in Newspeak as doublethink. If all others accepted the lie which the party imposed, if all records told the same tale, then the lie passed into history and became truth. Who controls the past, ran the party slogan, controls the future. Who controls the present, controls the past. And yet the past, though of its nature alterable, never had been altered. Whatever was true now was true from everlasting to everlasting. It was quite simple. All that was needed was an unending series of victories over your own memory. Reality control, they called it. In you speak, doublethink. To know and not to know. To be conscious of complete truthfulness while telling carefully constructed lies. To hold simultaneously two opinions, which cancelled out, knowing them to be contradictory and believing in both of them. To use logic against logic. To repudiate morality while laying claim to it. To believe that democracy was impossible and that the party was the guardian of democracy. To forget whatever it was necessary to forget, then to draw it back into memory again at the moment when it was needed, and then promptly to forget it again. And above all, to apply the same process to the process itself. That was the ultimate subtlety. Consciously to induce unconsciousness. And then once again to become unconscious of the act of hypnosis you had just performed. Even to understand the word doublethink involved the use of doublethink. I'll handle the rest. Here. That's your name as of today. You best change your face, too. Now this one, he'll take your place. From here on, he's Snake. He believes it, too. My very own phantom, huh? <laughs> In the white version of this double think, we are not Big Boss at all. Not as he is here. Not yet. We are instead some remembered version or half-remembered version of Naked Snake, as he was back in 1964. Imrik becomes here our stand-in for Sokolov. Skullface and XOF are Cobra's boss and Volgan. The structure of this operation and that of the Virtuous mission are essentially identical, down even to the surprise helicopter and sudden appearance of the game's titular Metal Gear near the end. But now for the black version of Doublethink. In this black narrative, we are the demon Big Boss, back from the dead, all for revenge. Huey here is not any mere rescue target, he is our enemy, a criminal on the run from our justice. In this same way, when we look at Skullface, we see both the character Skullface and the dim echo of a character from yesterday, or rather, in the game's world, the future, Ocelot. The relationship between past, present, and future is something, of course, that's central to 1984, as it is for the Phantom Pain. Now, stitching together both black and white narratives here into a single double-think shape, becoming in the process neither black nor white, but black-white, that's how Hellbound plays out. I submit it's for this reason, only by such a contrivance, created from the leftovers of other ages and personalities, is the real protagonist, Venom Snake, able to gradually change from the inside, from the story's Snake in the white version to the story's Big Boss in the black.
every Metal Gear game has had this polarity between player character and central antagonist. MGS3 showed us that's by design. That's how the system, later known as the Patriots, maintains its equilibrium. By a balance between the two extremes, the black and the white, the hero and the villain. Do you understand what I'm saying, Snake? By consuming me and you, the philosophers intend to keep that cycle going forever. This is another sense of the term black-white. Enemy. We were together for 10 years, and now you tell me she's my enemy? The question here is, how can Phantom Pain possibly subvert such a series staple? Well, it's simple. In the Phantom Pain, the snake and the big boss, the black and the white, are more than ever, before or ever again, one in the same. It's just like how Walter White is also the same man by the end that people in Breaking Bad know and fear as Heisenberg. The central character's very personality, his sense of self, changes in both works as it's reinvented, as it reinvents itself before our very eyes. In this way, we see for ourselves the phantasmic wisdom contained in Skullface's words. Words are peculiar. War changed. And not only my visage. Words can kill. All we need to focus on for now is that Emmerich is meant to be taken by Diamond Dogs in this scene. Everything we see here, in other words, is actually part of a performance. I'm taking your legs back! What are you planning to do? Steal this thing? Steal? No, no. I'm taking it back. We still have use for it. No different than Liquid and Ocelot in MGS1, and how they pretended not to notice Snake as they led him unwittingly to arm the very weapon he thought he was disarming. If the code is in it again, it'll be deactivated. No need to worry. The DARPA chief and the arms tech president are both dead. Does Snake know how the override system works? You interrogated him, don't you know? To some extent, the quiet confrontation was no different here. I believe Quiet let herself be captured to spread the English strain of vocal cord parasites one day on Mother Base, all just as this scene plays out as Skullface envisioned. But why is Huey involved, though? Well, this has to do with what I now can only vaguely call Skullface's ghost in the machine plan, something that we'll have to return to again and again as we go forward, and in a subsequent video. Bipedal. So that's why they needed Huey. Long story short, Metal Gears will be his final parasite, final poisoned gift to infect the system and bring it one day crashing down. The thirst for revenge that I have planted will infest the system. No one can stop it now. Sahalanthropus will unleash that thirst unto the future! Major... I'm burning up! His ultimate killer weapon... It's no weapon at all, it's a word. This war is peace. And Huey and his son Hal will both prove instrumental as pawns in this master scheme in promulgating that word. That word being, of course, Metal Gear. The world will need a new common tongue. A language of nukes. My Metal Gears shall be the thread by which all countries are bound together. Inequality. No words will be needed. But none of this is clear as of yet. Instead, players are confronted with a strange medley of sights and sounds that we might compare to a composite. Skullface and his XOF retinue are very much like the specters we found in Ground Zeroes. Yet the scene itself mimics also one from Peace Walker, the confrontation between Huey and Hot Coldman. <laughs> 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 
Meanwhile, the setting in general feels completely pulled from both the dark, dank tunnel of MGS3 and the space between radio towers that we see in MGS1 and MGS4. It's of course also our first glimpse here at the game's titular Metal Gear, namely Sahelanthropus, though we won't know that word, that name, until later. The camera takes on that floating phantasm quality that I associated last time with the presence of Psychomantis. We glide behind the truck and pad up the stairs in hand cam mode to zero in not on Skullface, but first Huey beside him. The camera frames Huey's new exo legs, frame being the operative word, framing his legs and Sahelanthropus together in one image, strongly implying thereby the link between them. Huey needs Sahelanthropus, we'll find, as much as Skullface does. As this shot hints, completing this revolutionary new weapon is to be Huey's way up, the way he'll stand as his own man on his own two legs. That he'll leave his mark on history. What? I only like those who can stand on their own. If you fancy me, then come walk with me. Who knows what miracles might happen. I want my memory, my existence to remain. Unlike an intron of history, I will be remembered as an exon. That will be my legacy, my mark in history. But we also see, of course, those legs are not truly his own nor will be that contribution to history. Huey, we see, is dependent on some greater organism for his own life, the organism, or rather, organization that made both kinds of Huey's legs possible. We're also introduced here to a major recurring visual motif regarding Skullface, the bleary red light. But more on this strange phenomenon that seems to dog his trail like a ghost will come in due time. There's a bit of misdirection here, too. We might assume this truck has Skullface on board at first, but in reality, these are the men that Skullface has arranged to transport Huey from this extremely secure and remote location to one he'll be more easily captured from, the Soviet base camp. Yet it's all framed as a punishment, even an exile. Here I can't help but think in turn of how Zero supposedly banished an exiled Skullface to South Africa, which is exactly where he could do the most damage, irony of ironies, though I doubt in this case that that was by Zero's conscious intent. But I digress. We enter the scene in medias res, in the middle. A very old storytelling technique that goes back to ancient Greece. But we can still deduce the rub, as Shakespeare said. All along, before now, Huey's been thinking that Sahelanthropus will be piloted via AI. We'll later put together the facts as follows. Up until this point, Huey has been led to believe that Sahelanthropus, this weapons platform he's building for Skullface, will be piloted via AI, much like the Peace Walker project nine years prior. In fact, we'll later learn that this plan was so serious of a goal that Skullface at one point had Dr. Strangelove and Emmerich work on the machine's AI together, much as they had in the Caribbean nine years ago, after dredging the original from Lake Colsibolka. Zero. Zero. Or whoever it is who's taken its name. They found me. After the Caribbean. They made me simulate his will. So that even after the body was gone, that will would keep the world turning the way they were. It was this that catalyzed many significant story events, from Strangelove's eventual death to the construction of the networked neural AIs later known, I allege, to be the Patriots, as well as the worm cluster that Sonny will in MGS4, again, I allege, use to bring the system crashing down. In reality, Skullface never intended to finish Sahelanthropus as an AI weapon. Who said anything about an AI? Rather, it seems, he wanted to introduce things, the mere words, the ideas, 
words like AI networks and Metal Gears, to the system, to manipulate that system, the path of the development that this system would take. The entire Patriots society is like the superstructure composing a single individual's biome, you might say. And in this case, Skullface, as I'll explain in depth another time, is corrupting its youth no differently than he did with Chico and Paz. Setting into stone the type of individual that this youth will grow and become. Namely, the world of Metal Gear Solid 4. Part of that corruption, as always, involves, for this character, theatrical performances, ones of guilt and of shame, a new kind of tactical espionage. And that we can see here clear as day. Evidently, Skullface lured Huey to join his conspiracy at one time, and now turns on him, shaming him for it as a traitor. But I suppose I'm getting ahead of myself. It seems that we've arrived right on time, just as the Holanthropus is being snatched away from Huey's hands. This we must compare to the deprivation of Kaz's MSF at the end of Ground Zeroes, and how the same force that giveth in both cases taketh away. Give it back! This is a right that was ours! No! Give me back my legs! Right on schedule. Just as causes and your loss of MSF will make you both easier to steer blindly, the same is true of Huey, who would do anything to get his baby, Metal Gear, back. A ghostly prosthetic, perhaps, to replace the actual child and wife that he has lost as consequences of his own actions. Huey, a guilt-stricken man in denial and an inveterate liar, we might assume before now was given relative autonomy within the whale, within his little domain here and in the AI lab across the map. The purpose of this huge secret facility, this cave, seems to be to test the giant machine, or perhaps to construct it with the giant hallway cavern we later learn connecting it to the place the Holanthropus is housed while dormant, OKB0. The lab, meanwhile, in the Soviet base camp is clearly where Huey, and perhaps at one point Strangelove, works or had worked on the system's remote piloting and AI control. It seems that all along he's envisioned Metal Gear as a weapons platform to be controlled automatically, like the unmanned autonomous vehicles we'll see everywhere in MGS4. But here now, so coincidentally upon our arrival, Skullface is suddenly making Huey's dream into a nightmare. Now, apparently the machine will not use any AI at all, piloted instead, Huey presumes, manually by a human pilot. The entire project has run in parallel to Huey's new acquisition of legs, notice, and the sense of agency they no doubt bring. So Holanthropus is to be his true masterpiece, as I said, a bipedal weapon that will be for machines what the real Sahalanthropus to Chadensis, supposedly, at the time of the game's release, represented for the development of human beings eons ago the missing link between man and ape. Little does Huey realize, though, in the nine years since the siege on Mother Base, Kaz has been hunting him on a Moby Dick-like crusade. But more of this we'll cover later. Huey's dumbstruck at this point at the idea of redrafting the entire project, especially this late into development. But further insights here require turning for a moment to the tapes. In them, Huey will explain that this idea of making Sahelanthropus a manned platform was how the whole project actually began. It's implied this notion he derived from how Paz modified Zeke for manual operation back at the end of Peace Walker. However, central to the related plan of making the Metal Gear bipedal and all-terrain was an AI system for controlling posture, because Huey wanted to insulate any AI node from attacks having learned from how Big Boss took down the weapons platforms in Costa Rica, because this era was not yet a master of microelectronic miniaturization and nanotechnology, Size became an issue within the shared confines of Metal Gear's cockpit. Only a small amount of room for a human pilot could remain. It seems this, Huey initially theorized, could be solved by using children, child soldiers, as pilots. Any larger person would require a bigger head for the machine, which would become too big for its body to hold while walking upright.
An important detail, I mean really important detail, hidden in the tapes is that, and this is really ironic, the Peace Walker pod in Huey's lab with Strange Love's corpse inside it isn't the real Peace Walker pod from 74. Not anymore. Its original AI has been modified or removed. And this is the really big part. Apparently to become the basis for Zero's Patriots. Now it no longer actively calculates or thinks like a facsimile of a real human mind. The pod merely parrots things that the real boss once said, her meme without her mind, her form without substance. I sold your will to him. Now this pod is just one big shell. A husk. <laughs> Don't let it deceive you, Snake. It may sound like the boss, but it has neither a personality nor a will. Like Emmerich says, it's just a machine. This is a fake, fake boss. Exactly like you, Venom Snake, are a fake big boss, who in turn was created to be a knockoff of the original boss. If true, all of this would then be covered up by the premise that Sahelanthropus was originally going to use an AI similar to Peace Walkers. But if you listen to her tape very carefully, it's clear Strangelove can really only be talking about creating the Patriot AIs. Especially when, at the end, what she says to her son Hal as she's dying. I signed up for Zero's plan. Even now that he's halfway to dead, his plan lives on, leeching away at the wall. And it took your strength to make it happen. In using you, I put the world in his palm once and for all. Zero. Zero, or whoever it is who's taken his name, they found me after the Caribbean. They made me simulate his will so that even after the body was gone, that will would keep the world turning the way they were. I had no choice. They dredged Largo Kosi Bolka, pulled up your phantom, forced me to revive and modify you. I thought I could bring you back, but in the end, I sold your will to him. Now this part is just one big shell. A husk. <laughs> Your phantom's no longer here. Ever be afraid? Whatever happens in there, she'll be watching over you. The system, the framework for your world, will protect you. Huey and Strangelove were clearly brought together again in Afghanistan, not by Zero, but Skullface. So how could Strangelove's AI have mothered the Patriots if she was being held captive by Skullface, their ostensible enemy? Well, to make sense of this, we need only to think about how IDs and system security works generally. 
as we saw in MGS2 and 4, all you really need are the right credentials, the right password. It's entirely possible that Skullface and XOF more or less were able to hijack Zero's authority within the system, provided that they know a way in. So the Major believes zero suspicion equals total security. Very bold. It's just the kind of ruse I'd expect from him. So long as no one's suspicions are aroused, you could hide there forever. On the other hand, if someone figures it out, there are dozens of ways in. And he's so paranoid about information slipping out, no one involved has the full picture. That ignorance is a weakness. The downfall of a need-to-know system. The pitfalls are clear. Circumventing them will be simplicity itself. However, while this does explain how they managed to get away with so much, I personally don't believe Skullface was involved in the birth of the Patriots. Remember that the idea for creating the Patriots is the very thing that convinces Skullface to turn against Zero once and for all. We already know it's under development at the time Zero is poisoned in 1976. It's done, Exo. This world will become one. I have found the way. The world that the boss envisioned will finally become a reality. Race, tribal affiliations, national borders, even our faces will be irrelevant. We also know 1975, the year of Ground Zeroes, is also the year Dr. Clark, or paramedic, accomplishes a de-extinction of the vocal cord parasites as a remnant of the philosopher's ethnic cleanser parasites plan purely to test the efficacy of reverse evolution via ontogenesis. This country is rich with biological resources. Bacteria, nematodes, viruses. I'm sure we can find something here to bring that plan back into action. Forget it. The Cleanser Project was just another one of my predecessor's daydreams. And the vocal cord parasites? Were an excellent test case for reverse evolution. Nothing more. What matters now is the genetics technology behind that work. With genetics, the clumsiness in targeting an entire race isn't an issue. We can target specific individuals. Die. No need to breed multiple generations of parasite just to get results. But I... Don't be quaint, Exo. Clearly, in other words, Cypher at this time is putting everything it has into information control, into figuring out how to control the world from the inside out, 1984 style. What makes the most sense is that Strangelove was already working on reviving the boss's own proxy AI round about the same time, that Clark is working on reviving the parasites. Certainly not until the events of Ground Zeroes. Dr. Strangelove's departure came at a perfect time. The less Zeke-related staff here, the better. Wait, she left? That's right. You were away on a mission. She left last week. There's nothing cooking in AI weapons research, and Zeke is complete. There was really no reason for her to hang around. I'm surprised Huey let her go that easy. Yeah, his crush on Strangelove was never much of a secret, huh? He followed her everywhere while Zeke was in development. Boy, would she get pissed. But he does have a lot on his mind right now. I've got bigger issues to deal with. That's what he said. That's the spirit, Huey. You can tell the Patriots' plan is in full swing, at the very least, at the time of Zero's poisoning in 1976, because of how taken Zero in the tape, the secret recording of Zero and Skullface, clearly is with the whole grand experiment that he describes. The reverse evolution was just a stepping stone for him, but the Skullface, that stepping stone held the promise of something more. Given that HAL is born in 1980, all signs indicate the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan brought Strangelove and Huey back together, right at the time Strangelove was rekindling her flame for bringing an AI version of the boss back to life. We know all this because of the rationale she describes for procreating with Huey, little more for her than an unwitting sperm donor. My genes, your meme, a father would be irrelevant. 
This conception had to have happened in Afghanistan. The Soviets have no doubt agreed to the Walker Gear project out of hysteria for how poorly the Afghan war is going, but I genuinely question whether they know about the Sahelanthropus project itself. Notice how sealed off the Sahelanthropus dev project is from non-XOF personnel. Very unlike Huey's, or should I say Strangelove's, AI lab on the base. Clearly, this is exactly the same division, anyhow, of labor that we saw for the Peace Walker project. While Huey was tasked with reptile brain-like locomotion and postural control, it seems Strangelove was yet again initially in charge of the higher level AI, the mammal pod. Except at one point, Huey put Hal in Sahelanthropus, and in the ensuing fight between the couple, he more or less killed Strangelove by locking her inside the pod. She suffocated, just like how Big Boss perhaps entered his brain dead coma. Here we go. I'll say much more on this next episode, but this makes Huey's first line, it's just a machine when you enter the lab, both dark and compellingly rich with irony. It also seems worth noting that Imric's opening lines to you, it's just a machine, echo something that we learned DARPA Chief Sigint, aka Donald Anderson, had said during Peace Walker by way of Miller. And it's a key phrase for explaining how and why Cypher have gone from an interest in AI like the kind in Peace Walker to the kind we'll see take over the world by MGS2 and which we will finally take down ourselves in MGS4, namely the proxy AIs known as the Lalelule Lo, or alternatively, the Patriots. Huey evidently so desperately wanted his Metal Gear project that he'd been working on to succeed that he considered using a child pilot like Hal, his own son. Now, according to Miller, the confrontation over this with Strangelove that results in Huey killing her had to have occurred six months to a year ago. That all means that Huey has given everything to pursue a wild dream that, as of our encounter during Hellbound, is probably never going to pan out. He became a demon for such little weapons as that. All this just severely begs the question why and whether Huey even requested extraction from Diamond Dogs in the first place. Boss, a certain scientist has contacted us wanting to defect from the East. His name is Emmerich. That's right. The name we knew is Huey. We suspect he was complicit in the attack on Mother Base nine years ago. He was working with Cypher. I've been waiting a long time for this. So I say, let's help Emmerich defect. Whatever the angle, it all leads back to Huey. I curse my own stupidity for not realizing sooner. Huey escaped with that unit by chopper. I've been hunting him for nine long years. The other reason I was operating around Afghanistan was to dig up his location. Huey's in Afghanistan? Yes, and I have a good idea where. Now we just wait for the right moment. This time, we'll be the ones using him. He's going to tell us who our guests really were that used a fake nuclear inspection to blast our home into the ocean. Sniper, where? When you do eventually make contact, it's immediately after Skullface has just made clear that he and Huey will no longer be working together, and right as Huey's life seems the most in danger. I think this is why he says, you came to save me, right? Ironically, he thinks he'll be safer with Diamond Dogs. How Strange Love and Huey's AI research will wind up in the hands of Skullface's enemy, Cypher, is left unsaid. But this scene certainly establishes at least that Huey has been allowed, if monitored, to contact Cypher in the United States. It may say that this contact was with Big Boss, but whatever the case, follow-up tapes seem to prove a secret line of communication exists between Huey and Cypher entities like ATGC. It seems Sahelanthropus's armor is made from depleted uranium. That offers some serious protection. The U.S. military is planning on using it for its main battle tanks, too. 
Maybe that's where Emmerich got the technology. There's no shortage of scientists out to get famous and patent their work, with morality taking a back seat. Isn't that a little outside your field? It's got nothing to do with my research. But I thought it might be of interest to you. Cloning, and Dr. Clark, I mean. Go on. Now, this is really highly classified stuff. But I've heard that an American biotech company has successfully cloned a human being. What's more, it happened over 10 years ago. And the researcher behind it was Dr. Clark. You've really never heard of him? I don't meet many doctors. This Dr. Clark is a complete ghost, even to others in his field. His age, where he comes from, that might not be his real name. And I can't even say for sure he's a he. Clark's employer, ATGC, its company motto is embracing your hopes, preserving talent. What does this have to do with me? Cypher. Anyway, Huey just wants to be famous to make up for all his sins, to cling on to idols like Sahelanthropus or the boss, just as he'll later tell us. Spreading military tech secrets from east to west only helps him achieve this goal, given their secrets that he in part helped devise. Clearly Huey has, whatever the case, no loyalty, as he'll later say, he's always been alone. So when Skullface calls him a traitor and throws him down the stairs, technically he isn't wrong. This is how Skullface operates, creating reality by bending lie into truth. But this spectacle distracts us from the much bigger picture. It's implied that Skullface essentially possessed the leadership of the Soviet Union like a brain parasite throughout this period, driving it to suicide by an invasion of Afghanistan, all it seems in order to serve as a testing, research, and development ground for Sahelanthropus. The machine's bipedal locomotion is designed precisely around the terrain of Afghanistan, notice. Its payload implies its purpose as a deterrent to check Western involvement in the conflict and region. The Soviets will be so distracted by the enemy abroad, the US, it won't notice the flies and festering maggots rotting and killing it from within. Parasites like the Mujahideen. All of this goes according to Skullface's plan, and Skullface here is covering up that really, he's dispensing with Emmerich not as some principled, spontaneous response to betrayal, but because it's part of this plan. Because the scientist's usefulness here and not there as a prisoner on the new mother base has come to its end. If you ask me, much of the Cypriot hospital incident was actually about field testing the true new secret source of Sahelanthropus' power, Psychomantis. The presence of the man on fire simply obscures this fact. Fittingly, Sahelanthropus will not be, as Huey presumes, a weapon of real military strength, but purely a weapon of psychological warfare. Sahelanthropus does not actually need to work, only perform a fitting display of working, thanks to Psychomantis, in order to achieve its true objectives, terrorizing and influencing the global rulers behind Cypher. But now, maybe I've said too much. If the world finds out about Sahelanthropus, Skullface will have won. His plans will become reality. He won't even need to use nukes. That thing's mere existence would be enough to enslave humanity to the fear of nuclear Armageddon. It would tear the world apart. Worlds can kill. V has come to. Skullface now throws Huey to the ground, towering over him like a giant. As Huey meekly and incredulously tries to make sense of the situation, Skullface gets right in his face. It's then he delivers one of the game's best examples of poetic, if maddening, ambiguity. It might be addressed not only to Huey, but to Big Boss, to Cypher, and anyone else wrapped up and possibly listening in to this conspiracy of global conquest. Skullface clearly abides by no one's sense of morality other than his own. Listen, I may dwell in the dark, but I refuse to be judged by your standards, traitor! 
shaming the scientist. It's then Skullface provides us the first glimpse at the other dimension to his secret plan, the mini Metal Gears called Walker Gears. It's a glimmering lure, not unlike Emmerich himself, that will lure us right when and where Skullface has already planned. The very point that he will make his new secretly mantis-powered weapon, Sahelanthropus's debut. This, he will say then, will be the day that weapons have learned to walk upright. Another interesting thing to observe in this scene, and how it contrasts with later ones in the same mission, is if you notice, XOF are not really part of the Red Army. They're embedded with the Red Army, but it's a disguise, a cover, obscuring the true nature of their research in the region, which is not for the benefit of the Soviet Union at all. Huey will deny the existence of XOF as its own unit or his involvement with them by denying the existence of OKB-0. Even if on paper Sahelanthropus is a Cold War weapon designed as a deterrent, in reality, it's being built to directly influence the post-Soviet age as a major factor in the Soviet Union's eventual collapse, particularly considering none of its technological innovations will benefit the Soviets, and its entire program is carried out using Western-born specialists, computers, apparently, and techniques. On multiple occasions, the game draws a comparison between the 70s-era project to recreate the boss's will that we saw in Peace Walker and the 80s-era one to do the same for Big Boss, not as a cyborg or AI, but as a different kind of artificial intelligence, a program installed in the mental contours of our minds, like the human software called Instinct, Memory, and Object Permanence. Let's also consider the Serac power plant and central base camp as the settings here. To begin with, Sirak, to my ears, comes awfully close to resembling Iraq, Iraq. While the Soviet camp looks a lot like this, the real-world Bagram Air Force Base in Afghanistan. Iraq and Afghanistan, the two first stops on the world tour of the post-9-11 war on terror. Both are being evoked in this mission. The end, Winston tells us, is contained in the beginning. This is the region America will rise as the final superpower, it's also where arguably it will fall, not in terms of military might alone, but again, in a warfare being waged psychologically. In a noteworthy nod to the twin beds and twin snakes of the prologue, there are two research centers where Emmerich might be found. If there's any question Skullface himself led you here, consider it's back in the power plant cave we can find a direct route to the real Huey's location in an intel file. In this, of course, we hear echoes of the structure of Ground Zeroes, where Skullface via Chico led us right to our true rescue target, Paz. Like with Paz, yet again, the person we're rescuing, we also to some degree despise, caught in our all too human definitions between enemy and friend. And as for Huey's lab, it may not be as well concealed as the one we saw in the cave, but it is still rather remote and isolated. The Soviets likely have no idea who or what they're actually guarding here. But the presence of Walker Gears on their base is a big clue. This is what they're getting from Skullface in exchange. Yet Walker Gears will be designed to cripple superpowers like the Soviet Union by effectively democratizing nuclear proliferation, making nukes not strictly the purview of superpowers like the Soviet Union. Think of the right to bear these arms for Skullface as tantamount to the right to vote, a political revolution, a new method of maintaining the balance of a new world order, one steered democratically and not unilaterally from on high. Which is how Skullface interprets Zero's idea of controlling the world via information. The big question the Phantom Pain deliberately skates past here is how and why did XOF and Skullface become so highly placed within the Soviet Union? Well, in this, we can draw parallels to where we began, Skullface's doppelganger, Ocelot. Both are essentially cipher assets working under deep cover as moles. And both happen to be exploiting this relationship for their own secret ends. Hellbound opens with a breaking and entering. Subtle use of colors and signs throughout the mission warn us of extreme danger, particularly the powder keg full of flammable material that we'll pass by when entering Emmerich's lab. One thing to note though here at the start is how members of XOF are in the cave arranged in a decisive if subtle callback to Ground Zeroes. Now, 
Now, this scene also makes a nod to Hal wetting himself in MGS1. Skullface, leering above us, can be clearly seen with something he's worn on his belt since at least Ground Zero's A Ring of Keys. This brings to mind, obviously, a jailer going by his western wear, one of the Old West variety. But I also here think of the phrase skeleton key, meaning a master key that opens every lock. Skullface's true plans are like a riddle, one only he knows how to, as it were, unlock. This seems to be more foreshadowing that Skullface knows much more than he lets on. Consider that for a millisecond, his eye line converges as XOF leave right on us. Well, does he see us or not? I'd argue he does, but also that he doesn't need to. This entire sequence, I claim, is something that Skullface has staged. It's the second time he's seemed to tease the existence of his new toy. One notice that we already know is operational, given we saw it moving during Where Do the Bees Sleep. Look at the size of that thing. They said it wasn't deployment ready, but... Boss, right now we have to focus on making contact with Emmerich. Let's get the truth out of him before we lose him again. A nice audio touch, by the way, here is how the fading echoes of the cavern's wheels down the forbidden hallway sound very much like Sahelanthropus's later heard screams. I have more on this, but I think we're already nearing the end of our time. So I'll close with this. One easily missed detail in the first confrontation with Sahelanthropus? Well, all of the Soviet soldiers who suddenly go missing. Until next time, boss.